two hits, two base hits, is all the Cardinals could muster on Saturday in a 2 nothing loss to the Diamondbacks at Bush Stadium. When I put out the Cardinals cards lineup on Twitter on Saturday afternoon before the game, I asked, was this the no Nolan, no problem edition for the Cardinals? Because Nolan Arenado had his two-game suspension reduced by MLB to one game, and he elected to go ahead and serve it on Saturday. So that is over and done with now for the Cardinals. Don't have to worry about that anymore. The fallout from the Mets-Cardinals brawl earlier in the week. Unfortunately, it was Nolan's bobblehead day, and he didn't get to play on that day, so that's a little bit of a bummer. Maybe he would have been able to help a Cardinals offense had he played. That simply could not get the job done on Saturday afternoon. You got a walk by Paul Goldschmidt. He reached base one time. That was in the ninth inning. Yadier Molina, base hit single. Harrison Bader. Base hit single, and that is it. No other hits, no other Cardinals reaching base via walk for the entire game against the Diamondbacks. 2-0, Arizona wins it. Merrill Kelly had seven shutout innings. He was really good. Noah Ramirez, Ian Kennedy came in for the Diamondbacks and closed the door, and that was that. So two days in a row, the Cardinals offense, uh, the bats have been pretty silent. As they lost 6-2 to two on Friday night at Bush Stadium, a real sleeper of a game. As Adam Wainwright walked five batters on Friday night, very uncharacteristic of him. And after the game, he just uh, talked about struggling for a feel with his pitches right now. It's not something that hasn't, it's not new. It's happened before over the course of your career, he said, when you play the game as long as he has. You're going to go through stretches like this one. But it has been the case that for a number of Wainwright starts so far this season, I'd say about three of them, we haven't really seen vintage Wainwright. He's been grinding through to get through five, get through six innings, has given up three or four runs in multiple occasions. On Friday, it was six innings, three runs on the five walks with the four base hits allowed. That is technically a quality start, but you could hear it in his voice after the game. He wasn't thrilled with the way it went down. Cardinals offense, though, I think was more of the story that night. Bullpen wasn't great, gave up three runs as well in three innings for St. Louis. But the offense on Friday scored just two runs against Arizona pitching on five hits. And so, again, kind of a sleepy night at the ballpark. And Saturday, the offense didn't pick it up without Arenado. They were even worse, as I mentioned, two hits and a walk over the course of nine innings. And so what we're here to talk about tonight, I'm not going to dig into the nitty-gritty on either of those games, considering I don't want to talk about them any more than you'd like to hear me discuss them. So we're just not going to get into the nitty-gritty on it, but we got to talk about the angle that everybody's wondering about in Cardinals Nation right now, which is what are they going to do about this dormant offense? Because you're not going to win very many games with two hits, one walk, and without scoring a run. In fact, you'll never win a game scoring zero runs, and yet that's something that the Cardinals have done now twice within their last five games. Previous series against the Mets, they had two runs in the opener and then were shut out in the second game. Back on Tuesday, they exploded in game three for a 10-run rally, and so that was nice to see from the offense, right? But what have we talked about a lot? It's been, where's the consistency going to come from? It's great to be able to do it every once in a while, but Cardinals teams of the past several years have always been able to do that on occasion. They've been able to burst out for runs when the circumstances are ripe for it, but they they have not consistently or as consistently as you would like to see been able to sustain throughout a series or a homestand or a road trip, consistently putting up four, five, six runs night after night to be able to give their team a chance to win as many games as you'd like to see. Cardinals won 90 games last year. That's great. They had a really good defensive team. Five gold glovers were honored before the game on Friday. Cardinals also were honored with the team gold glove award from 2021. And Nolan Arenado received the platinum glove for his work at third base. So we know about this team defensively. We know that pitching was kind of shaky last year off and on. But by the end of it, they had really put it together and put together a great stretch in September. 
the, the stretch in September is why they won 90 games. I mean, when you win 17 in a row at any point in the season, it would be hard not to get to 90, right? I, You'd have to play below 500 baseball the remainder of the year, essentially, not to get to 90 at that point. Because if you go 90 and 72, quick math tells me 73 and 72 was the Cardinals record outside of that winning streak. And so they're basically a 500 team last season that happened to go on a historic run in September, which was great. It got them into the playoffs. They had a battle with the Dodgers. They couldn't get over the hump. They lose that game. Quick exit from October. Okay. But what that meant was there were some issues with the roster, with the team and the Cardinals performance last season that were perhaps masked by the run in September. One of those things was the offense that at at times throughout the year was rather inconsistent. And you could even say during that 17-game run, they weren't always blowing teams out. Some nights it was the pitching that was carrying them, which is going to happen over the course of a season. You'd rather win those 2-1 to games than, than lose them. But where the Cardinals are right now is reminiscent of where they've been in some, of the, uh, in some of these recent seasons from an offensive perspective. Not that worried about the pitching right now, I got to say. Cardinals dealt with injuries last year, and that was a big reason that the pitching struggled. They didn't have the depth. Right now, I see depth in the rotation with the way the guys are performing, and I see depth in the bullpen. I think, I think they're going to be okay on arms. Knock on wood, injuries can always jump up at any given moment and can, can crush you. But Jack Flaherty is on the comeback trail right now. And even without Jack Flaherty, even with a Wainwright that is not performing up to his expectations and what people have have grown to expect of him again over the last couple few seasons, you still have a rotation that looks pretty darn good. Even with Steven Matz, who hasn't really assimilated the way you'd hoped as of yet. Dakota Hudson, Miles Michaelis, those guys are going out there right now every fifth day and just getting the job done. Miles Michaelis did it again on Saturday, and Ali Marmol actually said the reason he gave up any runs at all was on me. He gave up two home runs in the eighth inning. And Ali said, Miles did his job today, and I didn't do mine. Said he should have went to the Cardinals' bullpen in that eighth inning instead of trying to push Michaelis for one more. But all he sensed what the rest of us sense, which is try to get everything we can out of this awesome starter who's been doing a fantastic job because we don't know if we're going to get any runs, if or when. And so he pushed it a little too far. Michaelis gave up a couple home runs, ended up with two earned runs over the course of seven and a third innings pitch, seven strikeouts, four hits, no walks for Michaelis. He's been fantastic. Just excellent for the Cardinals ever since that first start, he, he or, or after the first start, I should say, through like three and, and change in the first start, just kind of getting uh, his feet wet for the season. And then from there, he's been lights out. And today, you could argue he was pushed a little bit too deep, maybe started to slow down a little bit in the eighth inning there, and that's why he gave up the two runs. I, I can't blame Ali Marmol for trying to run him out there. You probably should have gone to the bullpen, but it doesn't matter. Cardinals weren't going to win that game because they didn't score any runs, and it it didn't look like they were going to. They didn't look poised to do so. So it's hard for me to blame the manager for extending the starting pitcher. The only guy on the team had been really doing his job. It's hard for me to look at the manager and say, yep, that's why they lost, and Ollie's going to take it on the chin because that's that's what he's going to do to back up his players. But in reality, Ollie's not why they lost. Miles Michaelis is not why they lost on Saturday. The offense is why they lost. Plain and simple. And so that's the topic we're trying to get into here today because the Cardinals have a guy. (laughs) They've got a, uh, a, let's call him an infielder. Came up a third baseman. Cardinals picked up this guy named Nolan Arenado. So this other prospect, this other hitting sensation. Team said, okay, you can switch over to try to learn second base. Maybe second base will work for you. And then the Cardinals got rid of their gold glove second baseman, but they replaced him with another one. They replaced him with a guy who could walk right in, win a gold glove himself. And so, okay, maybe I don't really know what we're doing with this guy. He's in the minors. 
We told him to start playing second base. He's been doing some of that. But boy, there is one thing that we know this guy can do, and that's hit. And that's exactly what Nolan Gorman has continued to do as on Saturday, Memphis Redbird Nolan Gorman hit another home run, his 11th of the season, to lead all of professional baseball. Although I believe the Cardinals have a minor leaguer down in double A, down at Springfield named Moises Gomez, who hit a home run on Saturday as well, his 11th of the year. So technically, Gorman is tied for the lead in professional baseball with 11 home runs this season with another member of the Cardinals minor league organization. So that's special. You know how many home runs the Cardinals have at the major league level? 14. So uh, Nolan Gorman, you're only three behind, bud. He's gaining ground, folks. Nolan Gorman at Memphis this season, 11 home runs. Only 16 RBIs on those 11 home runs, but we really don't look at that or care about that because that's more of a statistic based on who's in front of you. It's good to get RBIs, but when you're hitting 11 homers, I I can't really complain about what your RBI total is because it's pretty clear you're doing your job and they maybe just should get some more guys on the, more ducks on the pond ahead of you. But let's go into the rate stats. 338 batting average, pretty good. In an era where batting average has kind of gone by the wayside, it's it's nice to see a guy hitting 338. Don't care what the level is. That would be a career high for Nolan Gorman since he's joined the Cardinals organization. He's always, I mean, he's gone 291, 248, 279. Now he's 338. On base of 390, that would also be a career high. And the dude is slugging 811. He's slugging 811. If you told me his OPS was 811, I'd be like, all right, that's pretty good. No, that's his slugging percentage. His OPS is 1,200. 1,201 to be exact. So yeah, Cardinals got this guy at AAA who's hit 11 home runs and 74 at-bats. Yes, he's got 27 strikeouts. That's way more than you want to see. I don't even care to talk about that anymore, to be honest with you, because the Cardinals are striking out at the big league level. They're not hitting 11 home runs. They got nobody doing that. So the strikeouts are what they are. They're going to happen. They'll probably happen more than you'd like to see for Nolan Gorman, but you know what? They happen more than I'd like to see for Paul Goldschmidt, more than you'd like to see for a lot of guys, right? It's just, it is what it is. That's modern baseball. Tyler O'Neill's striking out plenty. Where are his home runs this year? That's the point I'm trying to make because right now the Cardinals offense, even the guys who you assume were going to carry the load for this season, and maybe they still will, there's still time for that to happen, but right now we haven't seen it. And it's getting to a point where, again, I said on B-Shape Daily at the beginning of the season, my expectation was going to be the Brewers to win the division, the Cardinals to finish second, but for the Cardinals to reach the playoffs as a wild card. I think I said 89 wins was my guess, which would still be a fine season. But 89 wins would not get this team the division. And as of right now, you're beginning to fall behind the Milwaukee Brewers in the division. Three games back. Because they've won five in a row, eight out of their last ten. Cardinals have lost a couple straight and have only won four of their last ten. So that's the Brewers gaining four games on the Cardinals over the last ten that each team has played. Cardinals were up by a game. Now they're down by three. They're 11 and nine, and the Brewers have raced out to a 15 and seven record. That's tied for the best in the National League with the Mets. And you've got the Dodgers a game behind, and the San Francisco Giants a half game behind that mark, all with seven losses. So those are those are looking like your top teams to beat right now in the league. Cardinals aren't one of them, and it's been more because of the offense than anything else right now. You look up and down this Cardinals lineup. I'll read you the batting averages from the lineup on Saturday. Now, keep in mind, no Nolan Arenado in this lineup, so that was due to his suspension. Nothing you can do about that, really, after he appealed. And he didn't have to serve it on Saturday, but they just figured, let's get it over with, I assume, was the reasoning for that. But here are the batting averages. 300, 282, 174, 184, 204, 246, 184, 143, 174. That's five guys with a batting average that begins with a one, 
and you've got Yachty in there at 208. But you say, Brendan, it's 2022. I don't care about batting average anymore. And I would say I mostly agree with you, though I don't think you want it starting with a one, regardless of what you think, unless you're, who was it last year? Was it Grandal? Yasmani Grandal, I think, for a while had a 180, 190 average, but he was like on an all-star track because his on-base percentage was ridiculous. It was like north of 350 for a time. So unless you're doing that, you're, you're, you're having a dangerous situation. But let's go ahead and give the OPS, too, because that's the on-base percentage, which is a more valuable number to look at than just batting average alone because on-base percentage includes how many walks a guy is going to take, which is significant for, for guys who have good plate discipline. Hey, get on base any way you can, right? You, we all see, we've all seen money ball by now. That's the name of the game. So on-base percentage plus slugging percentage. Are you getting on base and are you hitting for power? Those two things, it's very rudimentary, but it adds up to be OPS, and I think that we can find some value in that. So here we go for the Cardinals. And again, if you're looking at the mid-700s, that's pretty average for an OPS. If you're getting to the 800-plus range, that's pretty good. 900, that's fantastic. Anything above that is you're talking about Mike Trout, okay? If you're getting into the 1,000 the OPS range, which I believe... Arenado still may be in that range, but he wasn't in the lineup today, so I'm not currently looking at his numbers. I can give them to you in a minute. Here are the OPSs for the Cardinals from Saturday. 881, that's Tommy Edmond. He's slowing down a bit, went 0 for 4 on Saturday, but he had been above 900, still hitting 300. He's the one guy in the lineup today to, to be able to claim that. 881, though, still good. And that's why you saw Tommy Edmond move up to the top of the lineup. Remember, Dylan Carlson was the leadoff man to begin the year. Didn't last for very long. And we'll explain why that is in a minute. But let me get through the rest of these OPS numbers. Goldsmith, 728. O'Neill, 502. Tyler O'Neill is at 174 on the batting average, 502 on the OPS, still batting third. Dickerson, bat cleanup today. It is what it is. 422 is his OPS. Yachty, 437. These are paltry numbers, guys. Bader, 654, starting to come up a little bit but still not where you want to see it. Carlson, 488. Brennan Donovan, 393. Not a whole lot of at-bats for him just yet, so we don't necessarily hold that against him. Sosa, the guy that a lot of people are saying, hey, he's got to play more because Paul DeYoung has performed so badly, which he has. But here's Sosa, 174 average, 443 OPS. That's four guys in the lineup in the 400s. Not even counting Brendan Donovan, who's below that. He just got here. O'Neill is barely clinging to a 500 OPS. I mean, guys, this is, uh, to give you an idea, and again, it's early in the season. So do I think that these are going to be the, the Cardinals' numbers offensively for the entire year for each individual that we're talking about? I don't believe that. However, let me just give you a name, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a number to it to give you an idea of how bad things have gone so far for some of these Cardinals hitters. 2020, Matt Carpenter had an OPS of 640, and people were not pleased. And then when the Cardinals brought him back for 2021, they were even less pleased, and he performed even worse. 581 OPS. He since has uh, had his option by the Cardinals declined, gone on to the Texas Rangers uh, to attempt to, to kind of rejuvenate his career over there. And he did not make the major league roster out of spring camp. He's been playing down at uh, AAA, 783 OPS in AAA. So that's good to see. I'll root for Matt Carpenter, but I'm not sure what kind of what kind of translation that'll be to the big leagues. But nevertheless, 581 was the OPS for Matt Carpenter last season. That was really bad. A lot of people recall that being, uh, you know, he just didn't have any power, couldn't hit for an average would still draw walks, but it was it was not... There's a reason that he was so maligned by the fan base. Okay, I'm going to count him up. From today's lineup, you got six guys with not only a lower OPS than that, but all but one of them was lower by well more than 100 points. All right, so yeah, we know the Cardinals' offense has been bad so far. Let's get over that, and let's get into the part about what are they going to do about it, or what can they do about it? Well... 
the clamoring has begun, and it's more than begun. It's really reached a fever pitch at this point about that guy that we talked about a little bit ago with the 11 home runs down in Memphis who's being taught second base and is learning on the fly to try to get his game defensively to a, to a spot where he can play the position. Well, he's got 11 home runs. He's got an OPS of 1,200. I have a feeling that'll play. And even if it doesn't, wouldn't you like to find out? Wouldn't you like to know what Nolan Gorman can be at the major league level? This Cardinals lineup could certainly use a guy that's hit 11 home runs in 18 games this season. I can't imagine it would hurt to give him a shot. 19 games, my apologies. It's been 19 games. But 11 home runs is 11 home runs. And so folks have been wondering, here's the way to do it. Here's the way to solve this. Because Paul DeYoung hasn't been hitting, and Edmundo Sosa, God love him, is not the answer as an everyday shortstop. I think he's a fine backup. He's a good bench player to have around. Good versatility. Can play three positions on the infield. You could probably stick him in the outfield if you had to. But offensively, he's he's just not going to be that. He's just not going to be that kind of bat. Okay, and he hasn't been so far this season. I believe his OPS is probably lower than DeYoung's. But DeYoung hasn't been able to get it done. Sosa's not the answer. So why don't you just call up Nolan Gorman? and move the gold glove second baseman Tommy Edmond to shortstop. He came up originally in the minors as a shortstop. Hasn't played the position much over the last couple few years since he got to the big leagues. But you know what? He did it before. He could do it again. He's refined and improved so much as a defensive player that he won a darn gold glove in his first year at a, as a full-time starter in one position. Because before, the Cardinals have been moving him around to the outfield. Second base, they, they put him at some third base, I want to say. Now he is settled in as a second baseman in 2021, immediately wins the gold glove, beats out Colton Wong, the guy that they jettisoned to give Tommy Ebbin that everyday role. Okay, can't argue with that. But now you've got a situation where you can stack the gold gloves to the ceiling, but if you don't have an offense, it's not going to result in wins. You're not going to win games with the inconsistent offense we've seen from the Cardinals. And listen, if they all want to turn it up at once, and say, guys, haha, we were just kidding. We're actually a powerful offense the way that Ali Marmol said we were on day one in his office at Bush Stadium talking to a group of reporters. He said, we will have a powerful offense this season. We feel really good about the gains we've made, and we're going to show everybody. Okay, and they came out of the gate strong. They really did. We've seen it kind of decline since then, and now we're sitting here wondering, okay, what is this team as an offense? Because, again, I talked about last year and how they won 90 games and they had some inconsistent pitching, but they seem to have figured that out for this year. The defense is what it is. You feel good about that. What is the offense this year compared to what it was last year? And last year, we're acknowledging that the offense wasn't good enough overall. It wasn't a bad offense. It ranked dead middle of the league, 15th in OPS at 725 in 2021. It was the inconsistency that we didn't love about the offense. Like, you want to be better than the, the the dead middle of the league. You want to be top half. You want to be top 12, top 10 in certain offensive categories. And the Cardinals were middle of the road. But it was outbursts, and then it was nothing. It was feast, and then it was famine. And you wanted to, with Jeff Albert at the helm, and we know the changeover that the Cardinals had in their leadership over the offseason, whether that was Mike Schilt versus Jeff Albert, Whatever it was, the organization landed with, here's where how we're moving forward. We're doubling down on the analytic approach. We're doubling down on Jeff Albert. Let's get this thing rolling offensively. I don't know whose fault it is. I know that the Cardinals have a 658 OPS this year, 19th in the league. So, so far, about a month in, close to a month in, a little bit of regression. Now, I think across the league, OPS numbers are down. Right now, middle of the road would be Miami at number 15, and their OPS is 699. We said Cardinals last year was 725. Offense is down across baseball. So I can't pin that all on Jeff Albert. I can't. I mean, it's a trend across the game. But if you're going to be one of the elite teams, you're going to have to find a way to buck that trend, and the Cardinals right now offensively are not getting it done. And there's too many guys in the lineup that are not getting it done to where you've got to find a way to get a boost. And so when Ali Marmol says 
And John Denton, beat writer for MLB.com, tweeted this out earlier today, or I should say yesterday, because I'm speaking to you now on Sunday morning, early in the middle of the night. Game took place on Saturday, and before Saturday's game, John tweeted this out, MLB.com beat writer. Cardinals manager Oliver Mamal says he hears the chatter about moving gold glove second baseman, that's Edmund, to shortstop, but believes it weakens the club defensively at two spots. Quote, I hear people when they say, what if he goes here and we bring up this guy? And you and I both know who this guy is. But understand what you're potentially losing, Marmol said. And he's referring to the defensive advantage that you have with Edmund at shortstop, or pardon me, with Edmund at second base and DeYoung slash Sosa at shortstop. Listen, I get it. You want to have a good defense. It's what the Cardinals were built upon last year. But it's getting to the point where, especially after Saturday's game, that's just an empty threat. The notion that you're losing so much defensively by moving your gold glove second baseman to shortstop. It had been maybe worse than DeYoung or Sosa at shortstop. By the way, neither DeYoung or Sosa has played that great of defense to my eyes this season. They've both been playing below their capabilities, in my opinion. But let's just say that's true, and, and Edmund's going to be worse at shortstop. And certainly, if you bring in Gorman and he's your second baseman, he's going to be worse than Edmund was. Edmund just won a gold glove, and Gorman hasn't played the position for more than a couple of years. Trying to prepare ever since the Cardinals got Arenado, it was like, well, crap. i got to figure out something if I want to get to the big leagues. Well, second base was an answer. And I get it. You do. You probably get worse at two positions, and you definitely get worse at one at second base. But at the same time, I don't I don't care. I, I just don't think that's a a factor that matters all that much at this point. Not when you're scoring zero runs and two runs. You gotta find offense any way you can. And you gotta shake up the lineup. The the conversation about the lineup, I had somebody ask me today, what's the deal with uh, Tyler O'Neill still batting third? Is it in his contract or something that he has to? And I replied, no. It's just look up and down the lineup. Who's taking it from him? Who's who's demanding that they should be batting higher in the batting order? Not a one of them is. Because when that happened, when Tommy Edmond began the season batting at the bottom of the order and Dylan Carlson was leadoff, it didn't take but seven or ten days and Edmond was back to the top because he was earning it. He was performing. So... My view of this, of the batting lineup, the batting orders conversation, I don't think Oliver Marmol is afraid to be be proactive in terms of shaking up the lineup to best suit the way guys are playing on a given day and to to base it off of matchups and performance to give the team the best chance with what they've got going that day to win. It's not, well, this guy's been in this leadoff spot so far and we can't possibly move him uh, because that could damage his psyche or whatever. No, he dropped Dylan Carlson. He's moving things around. There's no rigidity to the lineup. We've seen a lot of guys in a lot of different places and that's just perfectly fine. However, when you talk about the number three, O'Neal was your best hitter last year and he hasn't been this year. He struggled this year, but at the same time, I'm looking at that lineup you know, would you have rather had Dickerson bat higher today? Would you rather have Molina bat higher today? Was Bader going to bat three? Because nobody else has even a, above a 502 OPS besides Bader. And it, his is 654. So the reality is, and, and Goldschmidt has, has come around. He's got his up to 728, which is, it doesn't sound great, but it was better. it's better than it was. He had struggled out of the gate for sure after a, a, maybe a hot first couple of games. Now he's really come around, but everybody else is just not there right now. And so from a batting order perspective, I got nothing to say. Uh, Ali Marmol can do whatever he wants, and it's going to be right because when you've got, you know, 13 position players and 10 of them aren't hitting, it is what it is. You've got to fill out a lineup somehow. So that's where it is with that. But could Nolan Gorman help? And that's where I I had to respond after today's game. I retweeted Mr. John Denton, his tweet about Ali Marmol saying, understand what you're potentially losing defensively 
if you do bring somebody up and you move Tommy to shortstop. And I said, we've reached the point with the Cardinals offense where I begin to question the validity of this thought process. Sterling defense is awesome. Preserve it. If your lineup dictates, you can, absolutely. But you won't win too many games scoring zero runs and tweet. That's where I'm at right now. And I know a lot of Cardinals fans have been there for longer than just today. But today for me was the breaking point. You it's going on for too long. Nolan Gorman's got to be up with the big club ASAP. If you can't find a way to get him to St. Louis by Sunday morning, make sure he's he's with the team uh, by Monday, by Monday's game against the Royals, the makeup game on May 2nd. He's got to be in there, and he's got to be in your starting lineup every day. And whether that means you move Tommy Edmund to shortstop, whether it means nobody else is getting a crack at DH, fine. It, it shouldn't matter anymore. You got to try something. And Nolan Gorman, I get it. The strikeout numbers are higher than you wish they were, but he's got nothing to prove at AAA. Let's see if he's an, a major league baseball player. Let's see if he's a star in the making or if he or, or is he a quad A guy that's just going to be a, a stud at AAA, but he's not going to be able to produce in the majors. We don't know yet. We haven't gotten the chance to see it. He hasn't gotten the chance to show it. And I think at this point, I know it's only been about a month, not even a month, because of the delay with the lockout since the regular season began. It's time. Uh, The Cardinals' offense is is dormant. They don't have a whole lot of juice going right now. Nolan Gorman might be able to provide some. Make the move. I don't care about the 40-man roster, and I don't like it when, when the media and when the fans and certainly when the team make such a big deal about the 40 man. Oh, the 40 man. Here's the, here's the way I view that. Yes, it is technically a, an issue that has to be, it's a hurdle that has to be overcome, but the, 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 the level of ease with which that can take place is tremendously high. It is not hard. And I don't mean that as a slight to any player. It's not easy to, to have a guy be DFA'd on a human level. That sucks from a baseball, and we always talk about it's a business. From that side of things, it's so easy. And at any given time, I could probably find you a handful of guys that if they were DFA'd, A, some of them may not even be claimed, and so the Cardinals get to keep those players. Or B, uh, it just is what it is because they probably weren't going to have a significant future on the major league roster. And I'm not staring at the 40-man roster right now to do that. I'm not going to name names. Because there's no there's no value in that. Have some respect for guys that are working for their career and trying to make it happen. But from a business standpoint, I think everybody can sit back and say, All right, if you need if you need to bring up a guy who can immediately insert into your lineup, he said eleven home runs in triple A, and all you've got to do is pass this guy through waivers, guy X, Y, or Z. Don't talk to me about the forty man roster. The Cardinals historically, in my opinion, have waited and waited and waited too long and used the 40-man as an excuse at times where then eventually what do we see happen to those guys that they strain so hard to hang on to? They're jettisoned in the offseason. They're traded away for not a whole lot of a, a return. These things happen. It's baseball. So I'm not worried about the 40 man. Just make the move. I'm not worried about the amount of defense that you may lose. And listen, this conversation is going to sound silly, right? Tomorrow when when on Sunday the Cardinals go out and score 10 runs and say, oh, why do the Cardinals need an offensive boost? For me, is Nolan Gorman one of your best eight, nine hitters in the organization? I think it's a resounding yes at this point with the way the team is performing offensively. So you get him up here and you find a way to get him in there. He can DH. Listen, Corey Dickerson, you may have wasted $5 million. We don't know that for sure yet, but we do know that he's hitting 184, has a 422 OPS, hasn't hit a home run this season, doesn't have much power at this stage of his career, and yet he was your cleanup batter today on Saturday. That's what we know to be true at this point. And he was starting in left field, yet Bader... And Carlson in the outfield as well. O'Neal was getting a chance to DH on Saturday. That's fine. For me, Lars Newtbar at OPS 422. 
And then you could find out what he is moving down the road. So I'm not kicking Corey Dickerson out the door. When the signing happened, I thought, all right, this could be something interesting. He's an on-base guy. Let's see what he's got. Well, so far, it hasn't panned out. It's only been four weeks. I get it. But there will come a point where I would wonder, couldn't Lars Newtbar be getting these same at-bats? And then you can at least know because he's a part of your future. Corey Dickerson might be a part of your present because you signed him for this year. But Lars Newtbar is either a part of your future or he's not. And the only way to find that out effectively is to play the guy, but they've essentially blocked him. And I didn't agree at the beginning when they signed Dickerson that they blocked Newt Barr because I thought Dickerson could bring an element offensively that Newt Barr couldn't. We're waiting to see it. If he turns it on, that's great, but we haven't seen it. And so for me, the clock's got to be ticking where you got to be saying, we got to more effectively distribute these at bats and try to come up with a way to boost this offense. Brendan Donovan, they called him up. It's fine. But listen, I don't know what kind of hitter he's going to be at the big league level. He's probably more of a Sosa, right? Except he doesn't play shortstop. He plays first base. Not as valuable of a, of a position. Nolan Gorman, you could stick him over at first base if uh, Goldie needs a day. I know Albert Pujols, this guy that's on your bench, he could probably he probably owns a first baseman's mitt. I think you could figure it out. So unless Donovan is bringing some sort of offensive pizzazz to his game that we haven't seen in the short sample you could you could swap Gorman for him you make a 40-man move with a pitcher that we've never heard of and you're done and now you've got a guy in Gorman that could maybe bring a jolt to the offense lengthen the lineup a little bit you know on a day where Arenado can't play like today that would have been a nice day to have a guy like that at third base instead the Cardinals third baseman was was Donovan batting eighth in the lineup you know I for a team that's struggling for offense right now, I just look in the direction of Gorman. I don't guarantee you that they're going to bring him up and he's going to be the savior. I don't guarantee you that he's the next great thing, the next great offensive player in the organization. I don't know what he's going to be. I really don't. But it feels like right now would be a good time to start finding out, and I'm on board with it now. I was a little skeptical. I was hearing what the organization was saying about It was clear that they didn't have any intention of moving Edmund to shortstop, at least in in the short term. Because when you do that, what you're admitting is Sosa's not an answer at shortstop, and really we're we're kind of wondering whether DeYoung is as well. Well, guys, the secret might be out on that, right? You want to see DeYoung turn it around, but if he's playing every other day anyway, he's not getting starters, starters minutes, as they would say. He's not getting those everyday at-bats. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Find a way to to placate the players and, and, and give the guys confidence because you know that DeYoung, when he's going right, has been a valuable often, offensive player in the past. But at the same time, you got to figure out a way to win some games and, and score some runs to do it. So I think Gorman could be a helpful addition to that. I think it's pretty obvious the way you try to do it at this point. And listen, if you're not comfortable doing it that way, go ahead and keep putting DeYoung at shortstop. That's fine. Nolan Gorman can come up. He can be the DH just every day against right-handed pitching. If you want to throw Albert in there against left-handed pitching, that's fine. Because right now, the only person who you're really putting out to dry a little bit and doing that, at least in the short term, is Corey Dickerson, who's gotten his chance at least for the first four weeks or so, especially once they sent Newt Barr down. We've seen more Dickerson. He's got seven RBIs. He's had a few good hits and a a few important hits. I won't deny that. But he's the only left-handed bat on the bench that you're really feeling some kind of way about if you end up having to leave him on the bench for a few days in more of a pinch-hitting role than, than a guy who gets any starts. And you bring up Gorman, and you just DH him. Right This week, we've seen O'Neal get a chance at DH, so he should be well-rested. Goldsmith has done it recently. Arenado had to sit out today due to the suspension. So they shouldn't have a bunch of guys that need to cycle through for a day uh, off off their legs uh, where they don't play the field. Bring up Gorman, have him play for a week straight, see what happens. Because I know that the reason that they haven't called him up yet, one of the reasons, you talk about service time manipulation, which I don't think is a thing any longer. I feel like already uh, we've already passed that deadline. So if they brought him up, he wouldn't 
they would have already successfully manipulated if that's what they were doing, which I don't believe they were. I think initially he had a so-so spring and they didn't think he was necessarily ready. They signed Dickerson. They signed Albert Pujols. They said, this is the way we're going. It hasn't panned out so far. And he's been raking at AAA. That combination of factors tells you, all right, we're ready. It's time now. Whether they do it or not, I don't know. But I get the feeling that a few more days of this, maybe even one or two, and that could really start to swing the pendulum in the direction of the front office recognizing that maybe something needs to to happen. Something's got to give at that point. And when you hear Ali Marmol say, well, think about what you'd be compromising. He's not going to put the front office in a position where they're getting called out about what the state of the roster is. Ali Marmol, good communicator. That's not just with his players. He's doing a good job as well when he's facing the media and saying, hey, you know, I understand what people are looking at, right? He acknowledges that there's some merit to the thought of what could be a way to boost this offense. So Ali acknowledges that. He sees it. He's no dummy, right? He's a smart guy. But he says, hey, think about what you could be losing out by doing that. But he can say that because right now, the team as a collective, the the manager and the front office have not shifted to a plan where they're willing to consider Tommy Edmond shortstop what that might look like. The moment they do, though, it'll be obvious. And they'll say, well, yeah, we're just trying to, to shake things up a little bit. Maybe this can give us a boost offensively. And it'll be easy to explain, and everybody will understand it. Paul DeYoung may not understand it, but you, you'll point Paul DeYoung to his batting line, and that'll kind of be justification. And you'll say, hey, man, we want you to be that guy that, that you were in your first couple of years offensively. But that's what we're going to need from you. And without it, I, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. So could the Nolan Gorman experience begin in St. Louis at some point soon? It certainly seems possible. It's just a vibe that that you get after seeing the Cardinals get two hit by the Diamondbacks on Saturday that you just go, man, there's got to be something. And then you just continue to see the Memphis Redbirds, man. They're doing the Cardinals a disservice every time they tweet out those highlights. Yep, Nolan Gorman, he did it again. And Mosellock's got to be like, oh, you're kidding me, man. Making me look bad. No, I, I think Mosellock is on it too. He recognizes that we're we're reaching a breaking point here where if the offense can't get things going, that's where the front office steps in and says, hey, let's see if this kid uh, that we're really excited about is a hitting prospect. Let's see what he's got at the major league level because we've got spots for him. Even without doing something drastic like moving our gold glove second baseman to shortstop, I bet you with a little bit of synergy you find with the, the field manager, you say, hey, Ollie, we're bringing this kid up. Against right-handed pitching, we want to see this guy. You know, if you want to put Albert in there against lefties, that's still a good plan that we had from the beginning of the season. Maybe you sneak Gorman in here and there. Maybe you find a spot for him at second base occasionally. Give Tommy a blow. He's played a lot of second base in the field. I think you can find ways to get his bat in the lineup for a week and see if it works. And then if it did, guess what? You've It's a good problem to have, right? Suddenly, you're having a question of, how do we find a way to get this guy in the lineup because he's so good, we obviously can't keep him out. That's not the same problem that they're having right now is, boy, how do we come up with with a nine for the batting order that we feel good about? Because shortstop feels like a hole right now. And a lot of the guys that we've we've plotted for main contributor roles in our lineup are not performing. And so it's tricky. It's a, It's a tough job right now. Cardinals are still above 500. They're 11 and 9. I still say they'll have a good season. We've seen some really good things from the pitching staff. You know the defense is going to be there. Might it take a little bit of a hit if you go the Gorman route? Sure. But ultimately, I think the kid's going to be okay. I think he'll handle himself in the field. He's not going to win a gold glove at second base. But give Tommy Edmond a chance, too. Give him a little bit of credit. He might be able to pull off shortstop. Yes, there would be a question of what to do with Young at that point, but I, I don't think that. That question is suddenly created by the idea that you would make a shift there with Gorman and Edmund as your middle infield. I think it's created by the struggles that DeYoung has had so far this season. It's inevitable that that's going to be a conversation. Maybe it happens sooner than later. Maybe it's uncomfortable. But what's also uncomfortable is the Cardinals' offense right now. So we'll see the way they end up going about it. 
I'm curious as you are to see how long the Cardinals let this go, whether they can turn things around without a shakeup or whether that's exactly what they need to be able to move forward with a more dynamic offense. That's going to do it, though, for this edition of B-Shape Daily. I appreciate you guys, as always, for listening to my ranting and raving and dissecting of the Cardinals' current situation. Make sure you subscribe to B-Shape Daily on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Go ahead and leave a review. Five stars would be my preference, but whatever uh, number of stars you think we deserve, uh, would love for you to review the podcast to get it in front of more ears and eyes potentially as we put some of these on YouTube as well. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube to Charlie Marlowe's YouTube channel, and I'll be throwing some on my own at some point soon, but I haven't really publicized that yet. And so uh, if you want to hunt down my YouTube and subscribe, you're welcome to do so, but I'll make sure to blast it out on Twitter at bshafer 12 when the time comes. Appreciate you guys as always, and we'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace!